hope I can keep your attention. So thanks again for the invitation to tell you about um, our work on the genomic etiology of osteoarthritis. And as Philip said, uh, I recently, after 23 years in the UK, um, took the plans and moved to Munich, lovely Munich in Germany, seven months ago. So we're interested in studying osteoarthritis, and why is that? Well, it's a very common, prevalent disease. Almost half of us in this room will develop osteoarthritis during our lifetime. But there is no curative therapy. The main uh, mode of treating disease is through pain management, so managing the main symptom. And then that culminates usually into total joint replacement. There's almost 2 million arthroplasties annually in Europe. And therefore, there's a clear need to understand the mechanisms of disease to overcome this impasse and to develop disease-modifying treatments for osteoarthritis. Now, we know it's a complex disease caused by complex interplay between genes and the environment. And the epidemiological risk factors for osteoarthritis have been very well documented in the literature and include older age, female sex, obesity, joint injury, family history of disease, inactivity and joint abnormalities. The heritability of disease has been estimated to be about 50%, 60% for hip osteoarthritis, and about 40% for osteoarthritis of the knee. But to date, and this is uh, probably an accurate reflection of what we knew about the genetic underpinning of osteoarthritis a couple of years ago, um, we uh, weren't doing very well. So I'm showing here just the established, robustly replicating loci or variants uh, annotated by their closest gene um, as a function of risk allele frequency and effect size. And you can see that um, commensurate with osteoarthritis being a common complex disease, they're all common in frequency with small to modest effect sizes. And these associations are actually specific to joint, sex, severity, and or bone morphology. And by no means are they sufficient to pinpoint biological pathways. We know from physiological studies that bone remodeling, cartilage breaking down, and synovial hypertrophy are important in uh, the natural history of disease. But the underlying molecular mechanisms of osteoarthritis, both of pathogenesis and progression, remain incompletely characterized. And that's what motivates us to study this disease. And we're doing this by employing a three-pronged attack to the problem. We're using bigger sample sizes, better phenotype definition, and molecular profiling of relevant tissue. And they'll give you a snippet of results from each one of those three strands of investigation, starting with bigger sample size. So we've been uh, harnessing the power of large biomedical resources, including the UK Biobank and the National Joint Registry in the UK. We ran a pilot experiment in the first release of the UK Biobank dataset, whereby we identified 10,000 osteoarthritis cases and 40,000 uh, controls, um, and identified nine novel replicating uh, loci for the disease um, in uh, replicating in an Icelandic population, in fact. But the reason why we carried out this analysis and uh, was really to prepare for designing our larger study for when the full UK Biobank data of across 500,000 individuals would be released. And in fact, what we did was we defined osteoarthritis in two different ways. One, through the uh, self-report questionnaire data, and one through linkage to the uh, hospital episode statistic data uh, for hospital diagnosed definition of disease. And we were expecting to see better accuracy, higher power through the hospital diagnosed definition. But instead, uh, we did not. We actually saw a slight boost in power in using the self reported osteoarthritis definition, most likely driven by a slightly uh, larger, uh, well, an appreciably, I would say, larger sample size. So by uh, 10,000 individuals of hospital diagnosed, 13,000 with self-reported osteoarthritis. That really didn't help us in our study design in terms of computational efficiency. We still went ahead and did both <laughs> self-reported and hospital diagnosed in the full release of the UK Biobank data, um, where, which has recently been uh, published and through which we were able to increase, well, to more than double actually, the number of established osteoarthritis loci. That number is now uh, close to 90. 
And through this uh, genome-wide, this availability of genome-wide summer statistics, we're also able to start looking at genetic correlations between osteoarthritis and epidemiologically linked diseases. And indeed, we found several significant such genome-wide uh, correlations with traits that um, um, are epidemiologically linked to disease, so anthropometric traits, obesity-related, smoking, and bone-related uh, traits. But of course, correlation doesn't imply causation. So we've employed Mendelian randomization analysis to try and disentangle that relationship. And so we've been able to show yeah, there we go. that um, obesity-related traits like body mass index and waist circumference are indeed on the causal path to osteoarthritis, but that type 2 diabetes and blood triglyceride levels are not. And that resolves quite a long-standing a debate in the epidemiological literature. Moving on to the National Joint Registry. So the National Joint Registry is an arthroplasty registry in the UK that captures the vast majority of patients who undergo arthroplasty in the country. So we wanted to pilot accessing registry records for recruiting patients into genetics and genomic studies. And we picked hip dysplasia, an uncommon complex disease, as our proof of principle. So we identified individuals who had undergone hip arthroplasty due to hip dysplasia and um, consented them by post. We sent out saliva collection kits to those who consented and had quite a high return rate. We were also able to link through to their electronic radiographs obtained through the image exchange portal. We extracted DNA of high quality and performed the first European genome-wide association study for hip dysplasia, identifying a massive signal at the GDA5 gene, which is involved in bone development. And so we're very pleased with that first um, genome-wide significant hip dysplasia signal, but also in terms of um, design, uh, it was very e efficient so it was a fraction of uh, the cost of what it would cost to collect through um, uh, blood-based uh, collection center recruitment, but also it took just 18 months from consent through to Manhattan plot to complete. So moving forward, I, uh, this is uh, within the strand of bi bigger sample size, and so of course international collaboration is key in this. So last year, um, we founded the Genetics of Osteoarthritis, or GO, consortium, which brings together all um, um, available and accessible data sets for osteoarthritis with genome-wide genotype data. And we've currently performed the first uh, freeze of this meta-analysis across 180,000 cases and uh, over a million controls. So the contributing cohorts currently come from, as you will see, mainly the Northern Hemisphere um, and include population-based cohorts, disease registries, um, popula uh, populations with linkage to electronic health records and others. And this is an, um, I think it's the first time anyone showing this is the resulting Manhattan plot of the uh, effort. So we're identifying now over 100 novel replicating genome-wide significant signals for osteoarthritis, but also booting together information across all these different cohorts is now allowing us to look at, for the first time, different aspects of osteoarthritis, not just hip and knee, but also thumb, hand, and spine <coughs> osteoarthritis, and we're starting to identify loci that are associated with individual um, uh, traits, but also that uh, go across and overlap. So that's very um, exciting. What next for genetics of osteoarthritis? Well, we have a whole host of new friends who are joining and will uh, fold into the next um, stage of uh, the meta-analysis. I'm very excited about that. But certainly what we need to do going forward is further enhance the sample size. Osteoarthritis is common enough. We absolutely need to enhance diversity. And we need to start looking at the full allele frequency spectrum, um, empowered hopefully through sequence-based association studies. 
The second strand uh, for improving power in discovery of the genetic etiology of osteoarthritis relates to better phenotype definition. And this disease, as many others, is really not just a single entity. It's the endpoint of various processes that take place in the mainly relevant organ, the joint. So in addition to increasing sample size and in some ways to overcome that phenotype heterogeneity that uh, is not just yet completely harmonized, one can look at disease-related endophenotypes. We've been looking here at clinically important osteoarthritis endophenotypes derived from digitized radiographs, things like joint morphology, disease pattern, bone response, and severity. And we found some signals that we would never have found otherwise. So here's an example of atrophic versus non-atrophic bone response in just 1,000 hip osteoarthritis patients that reaches genome-wide significance and robustly replicates in an independent data set, and which resides within the GPR98 protein, the mouse knockout of which has low bone mass. If we look at the umbrella hip osteoarthritis term and compare those frequencies to controls, there is absolutely no evidence of association. So we have now started finding several of these endophenotype-related associations, which we can get with a smaller sample size because we're much closer to the underlying biology. This is where we are <coughs> at the moment. In terms of osteoarthritis, there are a couple of uh, large effects, rare variants identified in the uh, Icelandic population but not represented in others. And the, everything else, the vast majority, um, are common frequency variants, and all of those reside in non-coding sequence. So it's quite hard to go from variant to gene. There is a pathway to understanding the mechanism of action. We have been <laughs> differentiating human-induced pluripotent stem cells into chondrocytes and using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to introduce the variants and then uh, look at molecular and functional changes of the derived chondrocytes. And this work can give rise to mechanistic hypotheses that can then be tested in animal models of disease. And here, in collaboration with the Origins of Bone and Cartilage Disease Consortium, a strategic award funded by Wellcome, we have been knocking out the genes in uh, mice and then conducting high, um, high uh, rapid throughput uh, musculoskeletal phenotyping of those uh, mouse lines. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about molecular profiling of relevant tissue and how that can help us, as Nancy mentioned before, go from variant to gene to indeed mechanism. Now, osteoarthritis is one of uh, relatively few common complex diseases where access to the relevant tissue is uh, very much possible at the point of joint replacement surgery. So what we have been doing is collecting knees of individuals who uh, have them replaced for osteoarthritis, and we've been taking two sections, one from macroscopically healthy cartilage and one from degraded cartilage. And here is a section where cartilage is in blue and bone is in red um, from an intact part of the knee. And here you can see extensive tissue degeneration in the degraded part of the knee. Notably, these come from the same individual at the same point in time. So we've been collecting a few hundred of those in addition to synovial tissue and others, and been deploying multi-omic analysis uh, across different um, uh, levels. Here's an example of what we've been finding. There's 30 or so here I'm showing differentially expressed and differentially transcribed genes. Um, so on multiple omics levels, and some of them constitute potential biomarkers for osteoarthritis progression. Others, like the one circled in, uh, in uh, green here, um, uh, are the, the proteins uh, expressed by these genes um, constitute targets for existing and FDA-approved medications, but for different indications, therefore opening the opportunity for drug repositioning. And a couple of these have also now been knocked out through the OBCD consortium and show very stark musculoskeletal phenotypes. We're starting to see omics clustering by tissue, um, as I show here across different tissues, but also starting to see snip, uh, snippets of uh, clustering of patients here by joint affected. And this again is a figure I'm showing for the first time. We're showing now through clustering based on RNA-seq data 
two distinct clusters of patients, one with low inflammation and one with high inflammation. So that really uh, gives us hope that we can start um, stratifying patients based entirely on their molecular profiles. So to summarize, we have been trying to address the uh, question of the etiology of osteoarthritis by combining clinical information, but also genomics, epigenomics, and transcriptomics and proteomics data to identify novel genetic associations, molecular, produce molecular maps of primary tissue, <coughs> understand the processes uh, of disease progression, what takes you from this to this, We've been overlaying the multiomics data with the genetic association data to get to the function of variants, testing those hypotheses in mechanistic models, but ultimately the aim is to empower and accelerate translation, both by identifying biomarkers for disease progression, identifying novel targets and validating them for treatment, stratifying patients and creating opportunities for drug repositioning. So with that, I'd like to thank my many collaborators worldwide, both uh, through the Genetics of Osteoarthritis Consortium and uh, further afield. And last but not least, my team here pictured uh, at the Genome Campus in Kingston last year and my funders. Thank you. I gotta turn it on, okay. Um, the RNA sequencing. So w I was wondering if there was inflammatory marker data available for the cohorts that you were looking at or, uh, or is the RNA sequencing telling you something about which inflammatory, uh, that's, that's being inferred from the RNA sequencing, the inflammatory signatures? Yeah, that's right. So it's being um, inferred entirely based on the molecular profiles we're generating. So this picture is recapitulated when we use the genome-wide methylation data, when we use the proteomics data as well. Osteoarthritis is not an autoimmune disease, but low-grade inflammation does play a part. Obesity is a major risk factor for developing osteoarthritis, and it's not known whether that is mediated, that um, increased risk is mediated through the biomechanical stress or through systemic inflammation that uh, may be the result of obesity. What we are seeing here are two distinct groups, one with higher inflammation and one with lower inflammation that do not have differences in terms of their BMI. Okay, again, thank you very thank much, you. Ellie.